Our next uh, young and promising project leader is a researcher at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, Jon Olav Wik has worked with uh, varied uh, projects from trout to mammalian hearts. Now he has chosen to work with systems biology for salmon farming and with this will contribute to a healthy population worldwide. So, Dr. Wik, please. Thank you. Um, Digicel is about systems biology for salmon farming. That means understanding the live fish body as a set of components, gut, liver, muscle, that affect each other but also depend on each other. And why do we need such a systems understanding? Salmon farming in the future must navigate conflicting demands of sustainability, shifting feed prices, diseases, and product quality. The industry needs to develop a flexible and integrated basis of knowledge to rapidly meet new challenges. Digital will lay the foundations for a digital salmon, a knowledge base of salmon physiology in the form of mathematical models linked to omics data. And we will begin with the challenges of novel sustainable feedstuffs. Salmon farming is big in Norway. 1,000 farms employ 6,000 people who produce an enormous amount of salmon that produces an enormous amount of dinners around the world. The value generation in this industry is huge, estimated to 60,000 million kroner in 2013. Salmon are carnivores by nature. So in the early years of salmon farming, they were fed a diet that somewhat resembles the natural diet. <clears throat> and um, this was the case until about 15 years ago. Now, fish oil is a scarce resource. And so we had to teach salmon to eat this. And today, 75% of both the fat and the protein comes from plants. But this is not at all straightforward. In 10 years, or over a period of 10 years, a typical salmon feed has gone from containing 10 ingredients with one fat source and one protein source to more than 30 ingredients and several sources of both fat and protein. Also, plant-fed salmon is not particularly sustainable because now salmon farming is competing with plant production for human food. Feedstuff prices fluctuate rapidly and it is time-consuming and expensive to trial new feeds on fish. So, to meet these concerns of sustainability, people are now developing feeds based on things like yeast and microbial meal and microalgae. The newly started Center for Research-Based Innovation at NMBU, called Foods of Norway, are investigating the effects of these novel feeds on salmon and on pigs and on poultry. But the effects of novel feed ingredients on the salmon body are complex and they involve many organs. And this brings us to systems biology. We seek to understand the mechanisms that underlie the relationship between feed input and fillet output. In this way, you can draw much more powerful deductions from experiments than if you only view this as a black box input-output system. So one way to get an indication of what's going on is gene expression. It has become quite cheap to measure the expression of all genes in any given tissue. But this only works if you have a genome sequence. And fortunately, yesterday, the salmon genome sequence was published. And what you can um, see here is, ah, yeah. I'm firmly in the middle, but the Sigbjörn Lien at NMBU was uh, heading this work. It's crowning achievement of 10 years of work, so it's a very nice thing. This figure is beautiful to look at, but it also shows the chromosomes, 29 of them, in salmon, laid out in a circle, and then the colored bands 
link regions that have very high DNA sequence similarity. So you can see that following a whole genome duplication 100 million years ago, the pieces have been shifted around, but most of the salmon genome is still heavily duplicated. And this leaves scope for evolution. What you see here is the expression pattern over different tissues for lots of genes grouped by function, compared between salmon and its closest unduplicated relative, the pike. And what is interesting is that one duplicate tends to have the same expression pattern as the ancestral one, whereas the other one seems free to evolve perhaps new functions that remains to be seen. And last December, salmon genomics actually made the front page of Nature. Largely, uh, or the front page was largely due to this nice photograph by, uh, let me see, Audun Rickardsen. So, Digisal is a model-driven, tightly integrated, theoretical, experimental investigation into the mechanisms of the interactions between genetics and feed. Based on previous knowledge and theory, we design experimental studies to study how salmon metabolism responds to a change in diet. And we also make in vitro counterparts of some of these studies, which are faster and cheaper, and then help improve our understanding and refine the design for the longer running and more costly studies. The outcome is quantified by various methods and then informs the development of both statistical and more mechanistic models. So our aim is to deliver a predictive understanding of the effects of a whole range of possible diets much more efficiently than could be done by traditional feeding trials alone. So the traditional feeding trial is you have fish in different tanks and you feed them different stuff for some weeks or months and then you kill them and then you measure how, what they looked like. But if you take a slice of liver, or if you take a piece of liver, you can make many slices and then you can try out several diets on the same individual. This gives you much better control over the biological variability in the system. So here you cut open the fish, make a dice of uh, liver, superglue it onto a cylinder, encase it in agar. There is an ordinary Gillette razor cutting off thin slices, which then go into different petri dishes to be fed by vegetable oil or marine oils, for instance. And this is what it looks like after five days. So you can see different patterns depending on the fat sources. Now, underlying metabolism is a vast network of biochemical reactions, most of which are catalyzed by enzymes that are coded for by genes. And to understand nutrition, we must be able to understand the flow of metabolites through the system, how molecules get modified from the fish eats until it makes the flesh that we eat. So here is a typical biochemical reaction from the breakdown of sugar, and you can see the molecule changing. Now here you see the same reaction, together with many others, in three different representations. Also it is annotated by what genes code for the peptides that make up the proteins that together form the functional enzyme. There's the reaction equation, and here you can see that same reaction as part of a biochemical reaction network. And here is a matrix showing for this reaction how many molecules get consumed and how many molecules get formed of each type. And the nice thing is that this matrix can be computed upon. It is matrix algebra to see what are the stable flow patterns through this system. And combining this with measurements either of gene expression or the amount of metabolites, you can constrain the range of possible flux patterns that are consistent with observation. The data and models in Digital will be annotated using biological ontologies. That means that the professors will use the same names for the spreadsheet columns as the modelers will use for the variables and parameters in their code. That makes it so much easier to build on knowledge and to reuse it and adapt it to other purposes later.
So Digicel is really just the beginning. Our aim is to make a nationally and internationally inclusive knowledge base where we help people contribute their work, help with the annotation and curation to make it interoperable with other data and models and to make it easy to find and reuse. Future challenges will then be met quickly because you can reanalyze existing knowledge, identify knowledge gaps and design experiments to clarify the things that need clarifying. It is also my strong intention that this knowledge base will feed back to the management of wild populations and research into ecology and evolution. Because the models that are developed, motivated by industry, can be used equally well to estimate parameters for wild populations or from different individuals from a population. And that would require much less sample size than would be needed to develop the model from scratch. So the parameter differences between wild and farmed populations, for instance, serve as highly informative summaries of the very, very high dimensional de omics data that can be collected. There are many people and institutions involved in this project, and we also welcome input from other interesting, interested parties. So please visit our webpage and have a look, and thank you. <laughs>